Amigos y amigas, it's the Mexican Soccer Show. I am Weasel from Food Max Nation. This is an hour-long podcast dedicated to all things Mexican football. We're going to jump right in. Lots and lots to talk about today with Tata Martino's big press conference. Finally, officially official has been presented. And we're going to talk to Mr. Tom Marshall and ask him the very first question. Ideal question. It's the new start for a manager Looking ahead, four years, Mr. Tom in Guadalajara, is he going to make it to the to Qatar? What do you think? I think he will. Yeah, I, I do. Um, I think that you know. I think first of all, I think he's the right manager. So I think you know it's you know real positive that you know the, the Mexican Federation has been able to convince Tata Martino to come to to the Mexican national team. And secondly, I don't know. I mean, people can debate the Osorio era. But I tell you one thing it did establish was that it was that there was a process. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It established that he was there for three years um and, and they stuck with him even when they lost 7-0. Whereas I think everybody would agree that if you go back a few years within the Mexican Federation, a 7-0 loss would have meant automatic firing. So I think that I think that the Federation knows very well, or at least the idea is clear in you know Yondi Luisa and Guillermo Cantu. The, in in their heads, they they know that this has to be a process, and and you know the big the big goal is twenty twenty six with the home World Cup. I mean, I think that's the Qatar's obviously massive, but the one after that is absolutely incredibly huge. I I I voice uh, is your same opinion on that. I honestly believe that he will make it. What what are some things that? could derail that making it to four years. If it's if it's bombing out in the first, you know, the Copa America, I mean Copa Oro, which I don't think it'll happen. I think Mexico will make it, even if losing a final because of the process. So I, I don't I think this is a different FMF and what we've seen. Um it's not like they're in, you know, Copa Americas in the next four years. I mean you have the Cup of Nations and all of that, but I don't see intense amount of pressure that Tata has to go and do in order to prove. One of the biggest things that that managers were fired before was, you know, not beating the U.S. or not having a style or um, or if it's through qualify, uh, the you know, qualification process yeah. or that, that, you know, they're not performing or they might miss the World Cup. One, I don't see the region being as strong as it was maybe before. Not that we're any better, but at the same time, I don't see that much pressure. Uh, so I, I, I think he's going to go through. At the same time, I always ask the question, you know, what? when was the last time a manager was fired unjustly? And, you know, when, when we're thinking about that, it was back in the Chepo, before, uh, right after Chepo, right? When, um, Busite, and, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, Busite, Busite, Busite. I think that Busite is the only one that was like, they was hired and then all of a sudden they didn't like it for whatever reason. They didn't yeah. like him because of that last in Costa Rica. But even, yeah. bef- even before that, I think people anticipate because there's been eight, nine coaches since. Yeah, but I, 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 also, I also think with Martina, what he brings to the job, which you know Juan Carlos Osorio didn't. Was he? Br- he brings that CV, the resume. You know, Mexico can play bad games. They can lose in the you know semi final of the Gold Cup this summer, and Martino can turn around and say, you know, I've guided Paraguay to the quarter final before. You know, yeah. I've, I've been in charge of Argentina. I've reached two, three Copa America finals in my career. I know what I'm doing with guiding a, a, a national team. And I think that's you know that's fair. I mean, he's bringing such experience to the job, and I think that does that is going to weigh in terms of how the media, kind of the lens with which the, the media sees yeah. Tata Martino and the results. Whereas I don't think Osorio never got that benefit of the doubt because he was this outsider who you know from the start we were like, who is he? Basically, I mean, a lot of people. Well, I mean, even us guys, we were like, who is he? What's he done? What's he done to deserve to get the job? Whereas nobody's asking that with Martino. It's everybody knows that his his pedigree is absolutely there. Yeah, no, and I I'm I'm, right, I'm with you right there. I think when Osori was out, I was one of the big well, somebody that that said, you know, what has this guy done to deserve the <laughs> team? <laughs> and people giving him a chance, gave him a chance, and I was okay, finally gave him a chance. Um, after Chile was, you know, with what happened seven zero, many people wanted to get fired. And I'm like, let's continue with the process. And even then, I was one of the ones that said, let's continue. And it was Osorio who broke off. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. In, in in that, and so I kind of go back to I. People keep saying, well, the FM, you know how the you know how the Mexico is the they 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 rotate through managers like Osorio's rotations, but I I, I don't I don't see it. Again, who's the teach? And before yeah. that, maybe Hugo Sanchez because. Uh, it's been going on. Erickson needed to get fired. Chepa yeah. had an easy, you know, two, three years coming in. 
Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, even say, say for example, Ericsson, you know, I'm not even, I don't, I don't think for me, it's it's not even how bad things were going at that point. It's it's what is that? It's the person who hired him. Yeah, you know well, I mean? it's, he even shouldn't from that, have hired. He shouldn't have been. That's exactly. Whereas you look at Martino and he kind of he checks the boxes mm -hmm. in a way that Ericsson kind of didn't. Obviously, Ericsson. The idea with Ericsson was to bring in this guy from Europe with you know different ideas, but they were so extreme from what was the standard in Mexico. They were, and he, you know he didn't he didn't speak Spanish at the start, and you know it, it was he was always going to struggle, but. Just going back to your question, what what could derail Martino, you know, from 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 now to Qatar? For me, it's perfectly clear. I mean, for me, it's the it's not the pressure because it'd be absolutely false to say Martino hasn't been under pressure. Exactly. Before. You know, he's been in with Argentina, he's been with um, with Barcelona, and you know, even with Newell's old boys when he was the manager there. I mean. They were fighting relegation, and it's his hometown. He lives about ten blocks from the stadium. I mean, that's that's his, that's a different kind of pressure, but it's still there. The the thing that can derail is the expectation, you know, mixed with that pressure. And and if it's not if it's unrealistic, you know, and I think someone like Martino is a very grounded, very level headed individual. If he's getting the kind of abuse that Osorio took, I think Martino with his kind in of what resume, ways, in what what ways. Osorio took abuse. Um, you know the fans at the airport. They were saying, you know, go back home and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, but wasn't some... that kind of warranted because Osorio was always a mad scientist? You know, what was he up to? And I don't see Tata Martino kind of taking these ideas of let me try and putting people completely out of uh, out of uh, out of the way they play. You know, players on one side or the other. Or you know, to this day, I think he only. He didn't have a single start in eleven for his whole three years that he was there until the World Cup. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's what kind of game. Then the seven seven zero, I, all that started because Osorio gave everybody kind of the the ammunition to. No, but I mean, you know, every Mexico manager going back has got a lot of. I mean, even Miguel Herrera when he got fired for you know swinging at Martinoli, it was like let's not forget the amount of intense pressure that he was un under after winning the Gold Cup. That's the kind of expectation. You know, they didn't play well in the Gold Cup. They got lucky with those refereeing decisions against mm -hmm. Panama and Costa Rica. But what I'm saying is it's like you can't have that. You can't have a bad tournament without everything kind of, you know, every, you're getting criticised from all quarters. And I'll give you an example of Martino. You talk about rotation and Osorio. Martino in 2010 at the World Cup, it was a round of 16 against Japan, which Paraguay won on penalties. And then the quarterfinals against Spain. He made six changes to his starting eleven between those two those two games. Now, don't get me wrong; I'm not saying that Martinez <laughs> could be rotating like Osorio, but it's like th these things do happen. So I don't know, but that that for me, because M Martino, when he was at um, Atlanta, he talks about his family, and he said, you know, my next move before the Mexico obviously job was announced, my next move is going to be more for my family because you know, working in a club, you're there every day, coaching the grind away from home, blah blah blah. Okay, well, if you look back at the last few Mexico managers, I'm not sure the families of those guys would have particularly enjoyed the time. You know, Juan Carlos Osorio, I don't think his family enjoyed it. You know, Herrera, basically. Uh, his family did enjoy His daughter was everywhere with him. Yeah, he ended up swinging a bunch of journalists because <laughs> of something a journalist said about his daughter. You know, I don't know. And then going back to Chepo, you know, Chepo got divorced after, the, yeah. after his Mexico spell. I mean... It's you know, it, it, it takes a hell of a lot out of you, this job. It's and, like a president. You know, like a yeah, president. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, going back going back to your question, what can derail? I don't think it's on the field thing because I think he's unbelievably qualified for this job. For me, it's the it's the off the field stuff. And he, I just hope he's prepared for not just the criticism, but sometimes the unjust criticism that comes uh, with being a Mexico manager. <laughs> Uh, let's see what, I mean, I think most of the people are saying that he'll last, you know, we're looking at his, uh, Cisco from the, from our Twitter is, I think he'll last until Qatar. If the FMF didn't fire the last guy after losing 7-0, then, then I don't really see him firing Tata. <laughs> um, yeah, also, he'd have to pay a lot of money as well, because I imagine his, uh, his contract is very, very, very good. All right, uh, Tom, tell us a little bit about, for those that uh, missed the press conference, it was around, I believe, 11, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Um, you know, what can we take out of this press conference? 
very normal. There was a lot, a lot of talking before finally thought to get spoke out. But what kind of give us a recap, especially on uh, questions that <laughs> I feel like that the media already tell them, like, this is what we're going to be doing for the next four years. And how did that kind of take that? Yeah, I mean, I thought he would. I mean, it's what you expect. I mean, this guy's been in some massive jobs. He, yeah. He's there. He doesn't look under pressure. He's very, he looks the journalist in the eyes. He's assured. He knows what he wants to say. Um, he doesn't kind of go back and forth. He directly answers the question. Um, doesn't ramble on either. So, you know, he's he's not a, he's not a manager who's going to give the, the Piojo Herrera, you know, quotes every time there's a press conference. <laughs> but, he, but he does answer the questions. So, you know, I think I think there was some interesting stuff. I liked I liked his tone more than anything. I think that there was real positivity. Um, you know, he said that he, he believes he has the raw materials to do, a, a, you know, to be successful with Mexico. He talks about the young players, Diego Lainez, Roberto Alvarado, was two the two younger, two of the younger players that he picked out. But he made it really, really clear that this kind of generational change that I think, especially a lot of fans, want to happen, kind of from one day to the next. I think Martino made it very clear that this isn't a kind of he actually said it's not like you just um, with the stroke of a pen you get rid of a generation of players and then you bring in the next one. It's going to be a process. So I think Martino's very much aware of that. He said players who were 33, 34, they're not all of a sudden going to be kind of swept to one side. Um, but I think he's also aware that there is a new generation coming through and they're going to be, need, you know, they're going to need chances at some point. Um, yeah, and it, I mean, part of that was the. He talked about having kind of these micro cycles midweek. I think it was like I think it was four or five. If I remember three or four um, per year, where the domestic league MX players come in there, train with Martino for two three days mm -hmm. midweek. Um, I mean we've seen it before with Mexican national team, but um, but yeah, but I mean that's all well and good, but let's wait till he goes to speak to the league MX clubs and kind of you know he goes to Chivas and he says I want to take four of your players and he goes to America and he says. You know, I want to take a couple of your players. I mean, it's easier easier said than done. So it goes back to what we've always said as well. Martino's a great coach, but the, the other ingredients need to be there for, for this four years to be successful. Um, there's got to be, you know, the Liga MX clubs have got to support the national team more. More younger players have to play in Liga MX. You know, the, when, when there's an opportunity to export the player, um, Mexico needs more players in, in better leagues. So, um, yeah, I mean... It, that's not necessarily dependent on on what Martino does, but no, I, I liked it though. It, it, at the same time, he wasn't kind of ridiculously exaggerated and saying, you know, yeah, we're going to win the World Cup. Mexico can do this, can do that. It was kind of I like the kind of how he pitched it. I like the tone a lot. Well, I'm sure one of the I think one of the second questions was, you know, do you see him already making the quinto partido? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's the obsession of making that because, I mean, it comes down to it. That's a success for a Mexican coach getting us where we haven't been before, at least to where we've gotten in 86 and when Mexico World Cup. But um, how do you see Tata's expectations on this team? You said that the ingredients are there to make, to be big, but uh, is I mean, he wouldn't have taken the job if it was for fail. And obviously, I'm sure he's gotten other. Uh, offers from other people, including the U.S. Man national team. But um, oh, yeah. when he's asked that question, uh, what do you think his perception is as of the team to make him? No, I mean, you know, I, I think there's two things. He said he didn't get an offer from the U.S. and he didn't get an offer from Colombia or Argentina. So that's what he said. He said his first thing when he was deciding his, his career path after that, when well, with Atlanta, was do I want to negotiate with Atlanta? You know, that was his first thing on his mind. And then when he decided they didn't want to negotiate with Atlanta, then he kind of went, okay, Mexico are interested. And then he started talking to Mexico and immediately kind of, he liked the idea. Um, he watched Mexico in the 78 World Cup play against Germany and Mexico lost 6-1 <laughs> or 6-0. Yeah. Um, you know, back then, obviously, Mexico wasn't as good as it is now. But Martino said that Mexico is like one of, the, one of the nations in the world that has developed most in the last 20, 25 years. Yeah. And so he's kind of attracted to that, you know, the, the, the way that Mexico has developed, but also trying to now take the next step. But, and I mean, I, it's what I 100% agree with, is that there's no point talking about this quinto partido all the time. I mean, if, you, if you're if you in the top 10 of the world, you know, by 
you know, rationally speaking, in the once in, once at least in the next four World Cups, you're going to get to the, you know, to the quarterfinals. Well, so what he's saying is we need to get the idea together, we need to get the team together, we need to build a team, get a playing style, and then when we get to that fourth game, we can talk about you know making the fifth game, but that's in four years' time. So what's the point in bothering talking about that right now when it, we you know it's so far away and we don't even even know if we're going to get there yet. Yeah. So, um, so I don't know. He's kind of trying to take away this quinto partido, but I mean, you know, it is what it is. It's like when he went to Barcelona, you have to win the league. You know what I mean? When you go to Argentina, you want <laughs> to win the Copa America. You know, and, and he didn't do it. And it's like I think with Mexico, well, that, the trophy is the the fifth game. I mean, it's simple I think as that. That's where the um, some criticism might come in from the people that believe. You know, what is that the done? Um, outside yeah. of you know Neil's old boys and then Paraguay, which I think you know those are his biggest feet to get to Barcelona. Um, you know I, I was well, trying to do yeah. a little more research in Barcelona. I mean, this is Messi, Neymar, Valdez during the years that they were injured. I think it was during a a bad ref call that cost them the league, losing against uh, uh, I think Atlético Madrid in the in in the Champions. And it's it was kind of like a bad year for him. Uh, everything yeah. kind of felt bad. Um, and then obviously Argentina with with what happened against uh, against Chile. What I like is the fact that okay, he, you know, even if he would have won the champions with with Barcelona, I think we would we would hear that well, it's Barcelona. Why you know he should have won the champions. Or if he would have won with Argentina that year against Chile, well, he had Messi. You know, what I like is the fact that when he didn't have or he had a team or a solid team like, um, you know, News Old Voice or also uh, Paraguay, he did he, he did fine with players that, you know, in developing a style at least. And I want to see where, where that comes from because although we criticize Osorio, Osorio that's some, I mean, we, we, we kind of liked Osorio in, in some of the ways that, you know, obviously he's winning against Germany. One of the things that he was criticized is the style of play where he would come in. And are we going to have a Mexico the way that, you know, Chile's style or um, a German style or, you know, what, what is Mexico style? And it's not the much you know, going to bring it to us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I think Mexico did have a style. Sorry, on, you know, that's I disagree with a lot of Mexico fans who say, well, well you know, you know, what, we, what, how do we play? What we're playing? You know what I mean? I think there was a very definite style. And I think, you know, Martino actually said that he really liked Osorio's Mexico team. <laughs> um, so, you know, Martino was asked to, to kind of name a couple of, you know, managers that he liked for Mexico. And he said, you know, he, he liked La Volpe, but he really liked Osorio. I mean, I don't know. He tells you something about the people who actually work in the game. Yeah. I mean, Mexico made a real impact to the World Cup. And I mean, when Mexico trip up against Sweden and trip up against Brazil, I think for people outside of Mexico, that's not a massive shock shock you know that can happen but whereas beating germany in that way as well you know yeah. the way they built germany that yeah. was that was kind of a statement and i think that you know and, and also i mean uh, martino said he said i watched him in 78 get destroyed by germany and then in the last world cup we see germany so he's, he's basically saying look the raw materials there look at it you yeah. can see it you know that's um, what that's a I mean, great point that's a great on. point that you, that's a great point that you mentioned that actually he mentions because and I go back to always talking to my dad about about Mexico, and uh, you know, I'm ah, uh, and he he just tells me you have you you have no idea how much Mexico grew in those seventies and eighties into the nineties. Yeah, the team, and I, I mean, I have an uncle that was part of the Mexican national team in seventy eight during those. Uh, as far as a physical trainer, I mean, he he would tell me it was just horrendous. He knew you were going to get beaten six zero against Germany, or um, I think round. I think it was the worst World Cup in that seventy eight. Um, and then getting to the Quinto Partido in 86. And then now after, you know, after the, you know, after the group stages in, um, in um, all, all the World Cups and since then, it, it just shows the growth of Mexican soccer. But to people that have only seen that, you know, the, the 94 World Cup is where it started all. And it was, you have to get to that Quinto Partido. It's it kind of like people goes over people's heads, how much Mexico has grown. Um, as far as a country that has never won a World Cup or anything big, you can kind of see that. So, interesting that he, that he notes that. I like that. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and I mean, in, in terms of style of play, um, I think we know what we're going to get. I think Mexico is much more, the Mexican player pool is much more kind of conducive to playing Martino's preferred style of football 
than you know than Paraguay was, or that even Atlanta was. You know what I mean? Um, I think we're going to see. You know, we know the Martino style playing out the back. A lot of the time, pressing high. Obviously, very technically gifted players, preferring possession, being the protagonist. But and this is this is where, for example, Martino differs from someone like Marcelo Bielsa. There's a there's a degree of pragmatism, you know. So you can see, for example, if you watch the, the semi the semi final um, of the MLS Cup um, against against New York, mm -hmm. I think they had like 35 percent possession in the second leg. I mean, all right, they were they were kind of they were they were like looking after a lead because I think they won like three 0 or something in the first leg. So in the second leg, they, and and I think Martino does have that ability to kind of switch up his tactics. We saw he moved from a back four in his first season with Atlanta to a back three in his second season. You know, kind of shifted up the style of play a bit more ugly. And the same with Paraguay. The, honestly, Paraguay, what he did with Paraguay is absolutely fascinating. Um, and I was I was there recently in Paraguay, and he's like a like a legend, like he's like a national hero um, because he took a team that, you know, I watched a couple of games in Paraguay as well, first division games. And I don't know, you, you watch Paraguayan teams in the Libertadores and super physical, mainly 4-4-2, you know, yeah. very, very direct kind of football. And he kind of, he meshed all that with like, you know, technical ability. He didn't, but he didn't lose that kind of spirit. You know, the Paraguayan players are known for that. Just being absolutely hard, physical, yeah. steel, he kept that and then and then blended it in with kind of um, some more technical players and actually playing football. Um, so so if you look at his time with Paraguay, a lot of the important goals were scored from set pieces. But at the same time, you know, they could play. And if you look at the possession stats for when for when they played that, you know, 2010 Spain team, they weren't completely outpossessed. Um, at the same time, they committed a lot of fouls, so you could see what they were trying to do. So, so I like Martino in that respect. He is, he doesn't, he said in an interview, I think, with TDN today as well, he said, he said, in order to go, he got criticised in Argentina for not having a plan B. But he said, if players don't know the plan A, and this is very Bielsa, if players don't know the plan A, then you can't get to a plan B. You have to convince them of the plan A. Um, and I think that he's going to have that very much set in stone right now and, and how he wants this Mexican national team to play. And I think he's going to, I think it's going to be an incredibly exciting team, but let's not forget some of the games of Osorio were also, you know, were also pretty good. I mean, um, you know, the Germany game, the 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 game away against Belgium. I mean, in terms of style of play, um, they, they did they did they had some really really good games. Um, you know, away against the United States in Columbus. So so I don't know. I think he's going to build on what Osorio did in a way as well. I don't think it's going to be kind of throw everything away because you know things like defending set pieces. Martino is very very aware of. That is an absolute must in today's game. So I don't think we're all we're going to see, you know, a complete change from what Osorio did. But it's obviously not going to be as extreme as that. Like I'm not expecting the fullbacks, for example, to be, to be, you know, I'm not expecting him to play centre backs and put them at fullback a lot. Uh, yeah. Although I wouldn't rule it out either because someone like Edson Alvarez with his, you know, with his ability on the ball, um, I, can't, I don't know, I can't see why he can't he can't play there, but. You know, obviously, people disagree. <laughs> Dan and I also had an interesting question. Uh, I kind of think it was post conference. Uh, Kim Fonseca asked, "Este es el, it was el reto, el el reto más duro de tu carrera," which translates to just, I guess, maybe the the hardest thing in your career or or uh, hardest project. How would I pr translate that in your career? Meaning, you know, this is the hardest thing you're gonna do or have you done in your career? Um, and a lot, he's getting a lot of heat, you know, especially for that question, because, um, you know, we, we have people in the media already saying, you know, how would you think that this is the hardest thing when this is when a coach has <laughs> when, uh, coach has had Barcelona, Argentina? But how do you see especially that question in the way that he answered it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, they're making fun. Oh, well, there's a there's a like meme meme thing like with with uh, Messi dribbling past a defender. And uh, and it was like you know this is this is this is uh, you know a, a visual representation of how Martino answered the question by completely dodging it. It was like oh it's one of the biggest it's one of the biggest <laughs> challenges. But I mean I don't know I don't I don't I'm not got a problem with the question to be honest. I think a lot of people have, but um, I don't I don't see I don't see the problem with the question because at the end of the day it's the question was 
you know, what, is, is this the, the, the most difficult challenge? It's not yeah, like, is this, the, is this the biggest stage you've been at? Well, obviously not. No. You know, is, is Barcelona with Messi and winning the league a bigger challenge than, than Mexico getting the fifth game? Well, I, I don't know. Is it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I would, probably, I would, yeah. I mean, you know, he's, he's coming into news old boys fighting relegation. Exactly. Fighting relegation. 2011, 2012, and then winning the league. Is is that that's also a pretty big that's, challenge? Yeah. But taking over taking over Paraguay, um, like you did, and and you know reaching a World Cup quarter, quarter final was also a massive challenge. I mean, obviously there's levels of kind no, of I, how much. I would media. go with that would be even harder. I mean, here you have Messi, here you have Argentina. Sure, you know when you're looking at that, I would think those would be the biggest things, biggest stages. But at the same time, getting what Mexico to the quinto partido. It's tough. <laughs> I mean, getting any team right now to the quinto partido would be would be tough. Look at, yeah. look at what happened in the last World Cup. Yeah, I think it goes back to you know kind of the other stuff. Um, it's it's not. It doesn't. It, it could be any coach really, but in in some ways, what Mexico is it's kind of it's the situational things that need to improve as well. And like, you know, like I was mentioned before, more younger players, you know, getting opportunities. I mean, that's absolutely vital. Um, and obviously, Martino said that. I mean, he was very diplomatic as well. He was like, obviously, as Mexico coach, I want to see more youngsters playing. Like any other national team, that's going to be good. If you've got more youngsters playing, you've got more yeah. chance of, you know, better players coming through. But he was like, I'm not going to tell the um, the managers what to do. And I think that's directly, um, I don't know, I think he was being very careful because I think one of the problems with, with Juan Carlos Osorio was with the Liga MX managers. I think mm -hmm. he was, you know, I think through his press conferences, through the media, I think he was critical, you know, and I think a lot of the league ranks managers didn't like it one bit. You know, they think they, I think they took it personally when Osorio was making kind of general statements about Mexico. So I think Martino has been very careful to be like, I'm not here to rock the boat. I'm just here to kind of be a helping hand. Um, because, you know, he talks about MLS and players, you know, more Mexican players potentially going to MLS. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think let's, that, um, yeah. And, let's jump and, into know. that. Let's jump into that. Gio Della, you know, they, they asked him a question about the players in MLS and the way they answered and, you know, taking them to notice and, you know, the players are that are playing well. Um, it's, it becomes this, you know, fight almost. It's like, you know, that MLS is so, you know, under the Liga MX and, and the players are going to the wash stop where maybe before a few years back you would kind of be like, yeah, okay, they're retiring. But the league has grown, I think. We've all seen that. We're, obviously, our manager is was the, the uh, Atlanta's manager, which obviously won the league. But um, some people are still kind of like, oh, okay, you're still going to call Gio? <laughs> yeah, no. And he said, he said, you know, if Gio, if Gio steps up, he'll be involved. Like he's <laughs> not really anyone else. Answer. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. If Gio all of a sudden starts scoring a bunch of goals, it's like he's 38. Yeah. No. I mean, I don't know. I mean, Gio. Yes, I think, I think you know, <laughs> what, what I think happens though with MLS, with those three players, they kind of, everybody bunches them together mm -hmm. and they're not, just because they play in the same league and the friends and two of them are brothers, they're mm -hmm. not the same. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, Vela, you know, Martino came out and said that he was asked to name which, which Mexican player, Mexico's players are elite. And he said, Chucky Lozano, the second name he said was Herrera and the third name he said was Vela. He said, it doesn't matter that he plays in MLS. If Vela wants to, he's elite. Um, so that tells me that Vela is going to still be involved. Um, and he said, you know, Jonathan Dos Santos played under him at Barcelona, so they've got that's one of the players that Martino already knows. So you know, that's going to be that's going to be interesting as well. I think yeah. you know, this is good for Jonathan Dos Santos. But then the Geo one, I mean, Geo. It doesn't matter who the manager is. Geo's got a lot to do to get back into this national team. Um, yeah. You know, after the World Cup, you know, didn't you know hardly played, and then. You know, everything went on before and after and I don't know it, it, there's something he's just not playing well as well I mean you have to be playing well to get into the national team and right now he's quite a way off I mean forget the name forget who he is forget you know whatever he's done in his career if you look at right now where where he's at or what he's been out you know even since the World Cup he's been nowhere near the level I know with all the injuries as well he's been nowhere near the level of of being in this national team 
No, yeah, I think every I think everybody sees that already. I mean, yeah. And it yeah. took a while for everybody to get that. Even me, you know, we, we was like, when Gio wants to play, when he puts the national team shirt on, when it's important Gio to show up, and he didn't. Um, and those are the type of players that all right, you had your chance, you were good, thank you for what you did, and kind of take over. But yeah, lumping those players is definitely a mistake, in, in that you have that. Um, what else with Tata Martino, Tom? I want to ask you, uh, you got some ch a chance to, you know, spend some time in South America, Argentina, uh, Paraguay, uh, doing a little more research, talking to people that know Tata Martino. And uh, what can you tell us as far as the man? And, you know, you keep saying he's the right person for the job, not only because of his resume, but what else? We always compare to the Bielsa's and the style of the obsession of trying to get a system going from the very young to the top. Um, how 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 can we give you know, or what's going to be Tata's legacy when it comes to Mexico in that in that sense of like what are we should expect that you know that, that you've seen people talk to him about? You said he's a legend in, in Paraguay. Um, yeah. but what is that going to be here in Mexico, and how are we going to see that towards the future? No, I mean, first of all, I think everyone you speak to thinks he's a nice guy. I mean, you know, just like fundamentally, he's a really nice guy, and I think that that really helps. You know, it's like he's a very really... serious guy, but what, I've seen celebrations and talks, and like he's actually yeah, very he's... jovial. Like he's a very happy guy. Yeah. yeah, he jokes around and stuff as well. I mean, you know, he, yeah. he seems like a generally nice guy. I mean, you know, my story is going to go out, I think, on Wednesday on ESPN. But you know, he's basically his whole life centers around. His name was Sario. And so he married a, a girl he met at school um, who's from the same neighborhood. Her parents were from the neighborhood. His family's from the neighborhood. The kids were born in the neighborhood. His kind of um, sports club is right opposite his road, like right in front of his house. You know, he lives in, in a normal neighborhood in Rosario. And I mean, this is a guy who must be a millionaire probably more than more than one time over. I mean, they, most most of the players in Rosario and people to do with football live in kind of the country clubs because it's a, it's quite a violent city as well. Uh, there's like a narco, um, there's narco violence in Rosario. Uh, I think it's Argentina's most dangerous city. Um, and he just lives in his old neighborhood. I mean, his house is, you know, it is nicer than the majority of in the neighborhood, but it's like a, you know, a normal and a middle class neighborhood. I mean, it's Did you not, have to go to his house? Yeah, I went to his house. <laughs> yeah, this is Tom yeah. Marshall. If you ever think that Tom doesn't do his job and or uh, <laughs> goes out, Tom went to uh, <laughs> Tata Martino's house. You knock on the door and be like, hey, uh, who answers? Hey, is Tata about? <laughs> about? <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, he, he goes to he goes to eat at the same place with his – he goes to eat at a cafe in the center of Rosario with his friends. You know, obviously when he's not working, he plays football, tennis in the park near his house and, you know, people – know him around there and yeah i mean you know genuinely i think that people really you know really like him and and you know rosario perhaps it's maybe the most the fiercest rivalry in world football i know i know that's a big statement but but news old boy uh, old boys against rosario central you know it's it's probably as as vicious as you know river Boca, um mm -hmm. and it's concentrated in one city uh, whereas obviously in Buenos Aires there are many more teams. Um, so, what if you speak to people from Rosario Central? I mean, they, they, I mean honestly, they hate each other. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, the the intensity of the passion that that people there live this football rivalry is yeah. it's just unbelievable. It's almost a it's a borderline sickness. To be yeah. Oh, no, but, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I believe it. I believe it. But um, but you know the people from Rosario Central, they they've got they don't. Obviously, they don't like Martino. <laughs> They're never going to like somebody who's come from Newell's. But there's nothing wrong. You know, they, they, they respect him, basically. Um, and, you know, that's that's something you continue to hear in Rosario. People respect Martino. I mean, let's not forget, nobody's played for Newell's more times than, than Martino either. Um, yeah, he's interesting as a player as well. He was extremely lazy. <laughs> so he's, he's, I mean, you wouldn't expect it from a manager, but it wasn't until Bielsa came into Newell's at the end of Martino's career. Um, Early 90s. They, they actually started running because he, basically there's a stand in uh, Stadio Marcelo Bielsa with, and, with a shadow. And a, they used to play on the Sunday afternoons. And, and this is the local legend is that Martino used to play 
one half of the pitch in the shadow. And then when he, after half time, he'd, he'd drop sides and still play in the shadow. So they didn't, you know, he didn't overheat. But, you know, people kind of compared him to Riquelme in his style. Oh. I'm not saying he's good at Riquelme, but, you know, very, very technical, you know, kind of the puppet master pulling the strings of the team. But, you know, not really a hard worker. But then Bielsa comes in and Martino's quoted on record saying, you know, when Bielsa came in, it became absolutely clear to me, even though I was the captain, even though, you know, I was the I was the main player in the team, that if I didn't run, then I wasn't going to get picked. So I decided to run. <laughs> so, yeah. And then the other players said when they saw Martino run, they knew that they had to run as well. <laughs> Question, uh, Tom, how, how do you get to Paraguay? What, what's the connection there? Because I know he had, um, he, had he obviously played – uh, in Argentine, but how how did he get to Paraguay? Because he was in the he coached a couple of first teams before he got yeah, to the I mean, national team. Yeah, he wasn't. I don't think he was that successful initially um, in Argentina. He started out in the second division, uh, but obviously a well-known player in Argentina. But and especially at Newell's, obviously. But you know, he, he, he and he was close to the Argentina squad. Um, but he, he was never an established international, so it's not like someone, I don't know, let's like throw a name like Almeida, who, you know, it's easier to get a job if you've got that reputation. Yeah. You know, Martino's path is more like San Paoli, where, you know, you look for what you what you can get. So he went to the second division, then he went, I can't remember the, I think it was it, Colón in Argentina, but then he didn't really have any options, and then the, you know, the Paraguay, I think Libertad was the first club mm -hmm. to check it out. And so he goes over there, and then he absolutely loves it. Um, I think he goes on to uh, Cerro Porteño. And Cerro Porteño is a, a big, a big club. Um, and you know, he, won, he wins four titles. And then obviously, when that national team job comes up, you know, that, that's really where Tata Martino kind of, you know, obviously we did well in the Libertadores, but it's at that, it's at that 2010 World Cup that suddenly Tata Martino, you know, kind of came into you know people's radar beyond. You know, beyond South America. Yeah. All right. I was just wanted to wonder in that connection. Well, we'll see. Um, interesting enough, since we were talking about, it, I'm sure you guys mentioned it um, on the last Mexican talk show. Mexico is going to play Paraguay. <laughs> <laughs> um, which the storyline there is, you know, Tata Martino, what he did with Paraguay one, and then obviously Juan Carlos Osorio at Paraguay. Um, you know, it's. It's kind of, it's kind of funny, and then also Mexico Chile, which I would have thought they were they, Chile and Mexico love to play at Levi Stadium, but it's actually going to be San Diego where they're going to play. Um, good good teams for Tata Martino to kind of get a you know start, especially. I'm I'm excited about the JCO game just because that I mean these press conferences that we go to sometimes the uh, the opposition the, you know everyone just kind of looks at, but I'm really really I mean I can't wait to ask. Juan Carlos Osorio questions when he's not the pa the manager uh, of Mexico just to see you know what is going to come out. But at the same time, is that is that a good first first game? Yeah, they're okay. They're okay. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, well, let's not get you know they find the two good teams. It's not like it's not like they brought a team you know one of, an Iceland B team like we've seen before. Or, yeah. you know. And that, that's that's another thing. Like all of a sudden, you know, oh, Moleto games are teams against CONCACAF, now we're going to be facing a lot of Comnebol teams because of scheduling. It's like, oh, another Molero. It's like, first it was CONCACAF, now Comnebol teams are Moleros. It's like, Chile yeah. has become a Molero now? It's Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Granted, it's not the same Chile as before, but still. I guess the fact Mexico's played Chile in, August, in October, you know, it kind of takes a little bit of the edge off, you know. I don't know, but I think that, you know, neither the team made the World Cup either. But I think mm -hmm. on the positive side, both of them are preparing for Copa America. Yep. In the summer. So both of both of them are in, they're not going into this from like you know like a September friendly where you know there's nothing coming up. I mean for, for both the managers, uh, Rueda and Osorio, they're gonna they're gonna have to they're gonna have to work the teams for that for that Copa America because they're gonna be very important for both the managers. So so you know I think get yeah, the decent opposition. Um, I think from Mexico's point of view, good preparation for the um, Copa de Oro. Uh, because you know they're, they're a decent standard team. You know, Mexico aren't going to play many better teams in Concacaf yeah. than those two. You know, perhaps only the United States, if 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 any. When when that 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 Paraguay uh, 
game got mentioned, Tom. I, I, are you interested in asking Osorio anything? Uh, or you, or you, especially in that press conference. I, you know, I, I think that's going to be quite the show. No, yeah. I mean, I'm sure Osorio. Um, I was actually at the Paraguayan Federation as well um, down there, and I was speaking to the press officer, and I don't know. He seems pretty happy down there. From what you're saying, obviously, it's a whole different pickups there, right? There are some kind of problems with the media and Paraguay maybe taking the Colombia job or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's a different. It's so different down there. I mean, it is, it is it's a different world than in than in Mexico in terms of that that intensity. But um, but yeah, no, I don't know. I mean, I think what everybody wants to hear from Osorio is the story of what happened. What happened at the World Cup? You know yeah. what went what went right, what went wrong, um, the general experience of Mexico. You know, and I don't I don't know if he's going to talk about that. Oh, I don't think, think he is. is. He's going to say that I'm in a new team. This is a new. I only talk about Paraguay. That yeah. stuff. That, yeah. Oh, of course, he's not going to say anything. <laughs> I don't think he'll yeah. say anything. I can so, I can already hear his 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 voice. Like you know, respetamos lo que estamos. <laughs> he'll start with this little low. Um, I, I I just thought it was interesting. I mean. Yeah, yeah. To, to see that and that nostalgia of Osori coming back, but um, interesting enough. Uh, well, we know that for uh, at least for the national team, we have Copa Oro for the rest of the in the rest of the year. I think one of those things, obviously, is to win uh, the Copa Oro, get to the final. That's where the pressure will, will amount. I feel like you know with what the team has. Um, I'd be interested to see what the U.S. also brings, and then you know you have the friendlies here and there, but then. There's, like I said, there's not much pressure. We're not going to the Copa America, which at the same time is is bad, but at, first, at the same time it's good, I believe. If we're not going to send the, the, the right team out there, it's just add a pressure to the to the national team. Um, but we'll yeah. see. We'll see where it goes. No, I think it's uh, you know, I think it's it's a good tournament to start with, you know, for Martino. Mm-hmm. But basically, you can't. I mean, you're gonna. It's difficult to not get out of the group. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, especially Copa. the way that it's made. I mean, like two best third, know, third place teams make it. I think <laughs> <laughs> there's only three teams in the group. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you you get, I mean, you get out of the group, and then you know you have to play pretty spectacularly bad to kind of to get knocked out before the semi final. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, Mexico did to be fair against Jamaica. I mean, you know, that was a that was a terrible result for Osorio, um, and so yeah. But it's a nice tournament. I mean, he can play a few this, of the youngsters. He can mix it up. But this would be one of the first tournaments where the U.S. everyone has their team to try to win the the gold cup. You know, it's usually been one gold cup. The U.S. doesn't have a team, and Mexico has their team. Yeah. Or Mexico didn't make the final is because they brought a B team because they were in the Copa America, or they went to the Confederations Cup, or it, it, and finally we get to see this the the tournament that. That uh, you know, Coca Cola and what it has, and mm. and I think it, as much people say, oh, it's just a crappy tournament. I think it's it'll see what we have and what what are the teams that are come up and and Mexico is going to bring their team and U.S. is going to bring their team and we're probably going to see them in the final and here you know that rivalry will come because I don't remember the last time that a Mexico you know A team with a U.S. A team you know uh, especially in a Gold Cup in a full tournament played. No, yeah, no, I mean, I mean the the tournament set up for that to happen. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> like everything set up for that to happen and. You know, it's either been Mexico or the States, and it's they've, they've not done it. So, but yeah, no, I'm I'm quite looking forward to, to it now. I mean, you know, you got the US, obviously, new manager. You got Mexico, new manager. You know, you obviously you got that little bit of friction as well, be, because there's a lot of people in the United States who are pretty angry that the US soccer didn't speak to Tata Martino or didn't approach him. Um, so you know, you've got that floating around. You've got Matosas. Over there with Costa Rica, yeah, Matosas, Costa Rica. Um, you know, that, that's going to be absolutely fascinating because that, for me, he's, he's going to change the whole style and um, the way Costa Rica, the, the philosophy of how Costa Rica going to play football. And people are excited from people that I know that are close yeah. to Costa Rica. They're super excited uh, with Matosa going over there. And the the <laughs> one of the things is like we're going to be scoring a lot of goals. Like that's one of the things. I have a really really good friend. Um, that I tell you what, they're going to be excited. They're going to yeah. be excited. I don't think as as much as you respected that Costa Rica team under Pinto, you know, and, and they were very well drilled defensively, they were not exciting. <laughs> I think no. Man, I thought, no, it was just waiting made... for people's mistakes and capitalizing yeah, and I mean, on those mistakes. Honestly, it could go really badly because it's such a such a such a change from what the Costa Rica players have been used to. But 
Um, and I can see, you know, them losing some games big. Like I can see yeah. Mexico oh. turning them over 5 0, you know. Oh, I know Matosas. <laughs> yeah, you know Matosas. Really I know Matosas. Yeah, yeah. But when, he, when he gets it right, when he gets yeah, it right, it's right. spectacular. I mean, even the America team he had, yeah. I mean, they, were, they were wild. I mean, but unbelievably good to watch. So, so I'm really looking forward to that as well, to be honest. Yeah, and I mean, the likes of Panama growing in the years. Uh, you know, Canada, uh, as as far as, you know, I know that the, the region is, is poor, but it still makes for, for good football, especially in the Copa America. We're going to struggle. We've always had, in, I think, semifinals, somehow, one way in Copa America, one way or the other. It's like a coast, and, and we see that. So it, sh it should be interesting. Uh, national team, so at least we're there. I, you know, it was without a coach, it kind of gives you this, eh, like all those those friendlies and the, after the World Cup and, as, as much as, you know, we want to make it exciting as Uruguay and Chile and, and all those teams. Now with the coach, you know, people are going to be watching. I, I hear a lot of people are getting excited. There's the games that are that are happening already in March, the two in March, the the, the news with the Dallas Cowboys Stadium, the AT&T uh, Stadium. And it just, you know, I think here it comes again, and, and I think the fever will still be there. So, sure. We'll see. Let's uh, change gears really quick. First week of Liga MX. Before we, we end the show, I want to let you guys all know. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and send it to us. Hey, Guadalajara teams, everyone's happy? I mean, is, I, <laughs> kind of looking at that. I, I was trying to kind of ask what's the biggest shock um, of, for, of the weekend. If you look at scores-wise or what happened, um, because if, it feels like it's probably one of the biggest weekends to, to predict. I th you know, nothing happened that I thought would happen when I'm looking at it, when I'm watching the games, especially Atlas with the new signing or or Chivas coming with the right start. I so to you, what's the biggest shock of the weekend? I think the biggest shock was Lobos Black beating Santos. <laughs> yeah, even that, yeah. Lobos Black uh, you know, But, you know, I think Atlas's result away at Querétaro was amazing. I think Osvaldo Martinez, the Paraguayan like, playmaker, I think, you know, that could be one of the best signings of the offseason. Yeah. I mean, he's won the title his last two clubs. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's going to do that Atlas, but, <laughs> but, but I think he's, no, but that's, you know, a good that's what Atlas has been needing, right? Some, that type of player, something that brings a spark. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and I mean, it took him, I think, till week nine of the season, uh, of the Apertura, to only to score a goal. So it's like, they've already scored two in 90 minutes, so they're absolutely <laughs> winning but um, so yeah, and, and then I think Chivas. Chivas home you know, game. August was it? Yeah, since they, yeah the last they August. I think. Game. I think. I think it's now. I think they were coming into the game two wins in the last twenty-four league home games, which is a ridiculously bad record. Yeah. And so for them to come out, you know, I think uh, for Pepe Cardoso, I think it was a massive, massive result. And I don't know. I think there was a, a period of twenty minutes in that the start of the second half where you watch Chivas and you. You were like excited by him, and I think the, fan, the fans were getting behind him. And you know the the the, the versatility, the fluidity of the play, um, they, they just didn't let Cholos have the ball. They were just all over him. I mean, you know, it wasn't a perfect That's performance, it. but Polito got that opening goal, and then obviously Brituela got that that late one. But it was for me a good performance, and I think the the new signings kind of fit in well. I mean, it's different mm -hmm. to the Chivas team now, but I don't know. There was reason for Chivas to be hopeful, and I mean, don't there's a there's a long way to go for things to go wrong. Yeah, in game, but I, I think they're gonna. I think they definitely. I think they're gonna compete, and you know, they, they, they might be they might be around those kind of lower playoff spots. I think what we've seen that is, uh, I mean, I think it's gonna. They do have a lot to go for. It's not like Chivas fans are like, all right, we're good. Yeah, um, Pulido needs to be Pulido of how much they paid. That's that's the guy that that people are looking at. That's I think it's it, it's now or never for the guy. And then you know the reinforcements from the team, player like Iramier, who you know who uh, I think it, it fits him, and we all see that makes sense. of the players that brought in. So here it is, Chivas is not as bad as it as people thought. Mm -hmm. um, planted the clue the Club World Cup, but again I, I go back to what Mexican team really has done well, and maybe well, not as embarrassing, yeah. but. She was for a joke. Yeah, um, but, but but like you look at Aris Hernandez today, um, coming out and and putting a, a thing on Instagram. He made a comment on Instagram, um, on, on the profile I think of one of the, uh, what's he called, uh, fitness coaches. Um, you know, and he basically said he called 
Cardoso an idiot, basically, like publicly. Mm -hmm. And it's like there's so much going on behind the scenes with Chivas. And we saw Salcido was completely not happy. He said that yeah. Cardoso didn't speak to him. And there was so much kind of friction going around the club. And that's obviously why Higuera wanted to get rid of some of these players. Um, and it, it, I don't know. I mean, it's difficult. I'm not going to the club every day. But it, that performance definitely felt fresher. You know, it felt like it was it was a you know it was it was different. It was it was more positive, and I think fans responded as well. But for me, performance of the weekend, no doubt about it, it was Monterrey. I mean, Monterrey. That, well, it took a season for Monterrey to click with all those players. Now we're looking at it. <laughs> I mean, this Monterrey team now. I mean, obviously, you know, naturally when they win five 0 against a, a good Pachuca type, you can't help but get excited about the, the possibilities. You know. You look, at the, you look at the players that are still out. I mean, Maxi, Maxi Mesa has still got to come. Like an Argentine international, mm -hmm. in the World Cup. He's still to come. You know, you've got Saldiva, Rodolfo Pizarro's not properly fit yet. He was left on the bench. I mean, they've got a ridiculous amount to, you know, Basanta, the captain, was left out as well. I mean, this is a team that just so much depth, but... I'll tell you what, the, the most reassuring thing and, and, you know, coming two days before Tata Martino was announced, you look at that midfield and the performance of um, Carlos Rodriguez was a little bit special. I mean, yeah. he was involved in four of the five goals. He set up the first one with an absolutely superb pass. Yeah. He set up the second one with equally as good ball. Um, and then, you know, playing alongside Jonathan Gonzalez, yeah. that was... I mean, Jonathan Gonzalez as well coming back from injury, you thought... You know, he's had a really big last year. I mean, it must have been a tough last year because it was around this time, 12 months ago, that, you know, he made the decision to, to go with Mexico. And, and so for, for all that to happen and, you know, him to come back from this injury, his first major injury of his career, and to put in that performance, I was, I don't know, thinking with Jonathan Gonzalez, every time there's been something that kind of made me think, is this kid up to it? Is he up to it? He, he, he you know, he's... Yeah, I was questioning. I was questioning it over the weekend, and you know he scores a goal. His first league of Mexico. So yeah. um, I thought those two in the centre midfield were unbelievable. And you know what Diego Alonso said after the game as well was absolute breath of fresh air for for me. For, you know for Mexico national team fans, because he's basically said he said that Monterrey were looking to get a midfielder in, a central midfielder who can kind of you know basically dictate play. Is pretty much what he said. And he said, you know what? We were looking, we were thinking about signing one, but we found him and he's in the Cantera. He's, yeah. in, he's in the team. And, he's, and his name's Carlos Rodriguez. And this player, you know, he needs polishing. He's not the finished article, but this is a player who can make our team tick. Now, you know, I don't know, what is it, 60 million? Or I can't remember the figure that people throw out in the press about how much Monterrey has spent. For the heart of that team, you know, to be 22 years old, Carlos Rodriguez, 19 years old, Jonathan Gonzalez. Yeah. I mean that that's refreshing. I mean, I don't think it's going to last all season that they're starting together, but um, I really, really hope they are given a chance because uh, you know they, they they both look like real, real players, and 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 the quality they've got around them, they're not they don't look overawed. They don't look like there's a, a difference in class between them and you know Funes Mori or you know obviously different types of players. You know Medina, Nico Sanchez. I don't know. It's, I, I was very, very impressed. Obviously, Rodriguez was good in the league as well. But again, I thought this was a, a massive performance for Monterrey. Um, and on the other side, Pachuca, I think Ayesteran, he's got he's to blend those new signings in. It's, it's not going to be easy. Um, but I think he's still got a team to compete. They need to bounce back. Um, they need to bounce back this weekend. Um, and and you know, we'll see what they're made of because... Chuka's built, spent a lot of money on, on mm -hmm. signing. It's almost like they've used that Chucky Lozano money, um, you know, the, to, to kind of finally decide two years of not making the playoffs. All right. But, I mean, they've got by America away. You know, you expect him to, to beat Caretaro. I mean, I think, you know, I think if they fail to beat Caretaro and then they'll lose at America, you know, one point or zero points from the first three games and all of a sudden we know what it's like in, in Liga MX the pressure is going to be on straight away well I am definitely very 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 excited for for that duel and that and what a, what a way to start especially with Tata Martina coming in on Monday and and uh, seeing then that for the national team with Jonathan Gonzalez and Rodriguez 
um, and the, and that youngster. I, I was trying to think. I don't know why, but I feel like I'm really, really excited about a lot of the youngsters, the sub-23 players, you know, from Rodriguez and, and we're looking at Gonzalez, uh, Linus. It's like I don't remember the hype of youngsters, but performing in Liga MX teams in that sense. Um, yeah, we had, you know, back to the Geos and Vela and Moreno and all those uh, back in 2005. But as far as them performing in Liga MX teams and doing well, not necessarily in the national team in, in sub-23, sub-20 categories. I don't know. Maybe well, there's, there's, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a good few younger players now coming through. And, you know, starting to get a little bit excited, mixed in with Martino. And, you know, you look at you look around, you know, Marcelo Ruiz at Carretero, mm -hmm. you know, these kids at Monterrey. And I don't know, you know, even... Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> There's enough talent coming through these, you know, right now. It's quite, uh, I don't know, it's pretty reassuring. But there's not, there's not, there's not enough depth to it, obviously. But from what we've seen, the, the players stepping up and you know and doing the thing, we're starting to do it week in, week out, week out now, which is exactly what what they need to do. Uh, like I said, I'm excited for the Olympic team. Yeah, no, next yeah. year Japan, and oh, oh, oh yeah, hopefully, it's, it's not they're gonna coach it. No, it's going to be um, Jaime, um, Jaime, 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 Jaime Lozano. Lozano. <laughs> Jimmy Lozano. So, yeah, and, and that's a great hire as well because I think he's kind of one of the more advanced thinking Mexican coaches. And, and let's, not, let's not completely rule out him being the Mexico manager in 2026. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, there it is. That's not really out because he's gonna he's gonna be working closely with Tata Martino. You know, he's gonna go to the Olympics with the Mexican national team if they do well. You know, possibly he goes and gets experience elsewhere, or he stays with Tata and he becomes part of his coaching staff. And you know, he kind of smooth transition from from one to the other. Um, so we'll see. But yeah, and anything else? So we got a, a question from Robert uh, Cordova saying, how do you see Liga MX teams taking CCL seriously against old teams? Yeah, I think they're going to take it really seriously. I think um, I think this tournament now, we saw it last year. I thought, I thought it was really honest. I thought they, yeah. you know, obviously it's it designed to produce Liga MX versus MLS matchups. And, and obviously that, 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 you know, the, the round of 16 stage, he only got to Luca against Kansas City, but um, but yeah, I think the Mexican teams are, are gonna are fully behind it. I mean, you've only got what two, four, six, eight games, eight games to play, and and you've won the title. So um, yeah, I think it's I think it's different now the mentality with the Concacaf Champions League, um, and, and you look at a team like well, Tigres. You know, Tigres were desperate for an international title. Yeah, they got knocked out last time against um, Toronto. I mean, you know, if, if Tigres if Tigres face you know a new at Red Bulls or something in the semi-finals, then they're, they're not going to want to let it slip. Especially for Tuca's kind of legacy and Tigres being kind of the team of the decade. For me to to, to consolidate themselves as that team of the decade, they need they need that kind yeah. of continental title. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously San, Santos Laguna. You know the, the very outward looking club. They're going to be they're going to be going hard to Luca as well, and then Monterrey with the money that they've spent. Um, you know that could be. You know that they, they they probably go then almost favourite. But if Monterrey and Atlanta both win in the first in the first uh, round of sixteen, then they play each other. And I mean Atlanta Monterrey. I mean all of a sudden you look at the stadiums that those two teams play in. <laughs> and it kind of like suddenly this tournament becomes really exciting, you know what I mean? Whereas, whereas like a couple of years ago, about years ago with the group stage, it was so like I don't know, it was so boring, really. And now well, it all you know, those teams like, that I think the reason why it's become exciting is because MLS, you know, a team like Atlanta is going to come. I want to see that. It's like we keep hearing this great team, and okay, let's get those great teams against you know against uh, great uh, Liga MX teams and see how that's going to go. I want to see that. Yeah, the hundred percent, and it's you know it's like it's like last year, you know, when Chivas won, Toronto, you know, got past America, got past Tigres, and almost got past Chivas. But it's like there's no excuses. 
you know, this is what I like about this tournament yeah. and the way the way it's set up. Um, before you were playing your B team, you were you know messing mm -hmm. around, you weren't taking that seat. There's none of that now. It's a it's straight up playoffs, um, and it and it's it is the best. I mean, you look at the you know maybe not Houston Dynamo, but um, you know New York Red Bulls, Atlanta. You know the, the what they've done and and um, Toronto in it as well. Not yeah, Toronto is still in it. So yeah, it's the best of MLS. And then you look at Monterrey Tigres, um, you know you know Toluca. Santos, I mean, th those four teams have, have been have been up there near the top of Liga MX now for quite a while. Um, yeah. So it's like kind of no excuses. It's not like, oh, you know, Chivas won the title two years ago and now they're no good. I mean, some of the best teams in the leagues of, of the various leagues are, are kind of in these tournaments. So, yeah, I'm absolutely, absolutely can't wait for it, to be honest. Interesting. All right, guys, we come to the top of the hour. Uh, things to mention for the Mexicans abroad, Raul, with an amazing goal. We haven't seen it already. I, I tweet, tweeted it. It's on the Food Max Nation uh, account. Uh, just the way that he executes that goal, which I would have seen Raul Jimenez before pass it over because he did have a teammate. Watch that goal, and I've just seen Raul Jimenez has grown so much in the confidence that he has in scoring goals. Not that he do that in America, but um, just, just the way – uh, Guardado returns to Real Betis. Great, great news. Um, I still think you know it all is going to go through the leadership of Guardado and the way that the next generation. Hopefully, he can bring that. But uh, going through Hector Herrera's goal against Benfica, named goal of the year. Um, and I mean, that's that's pretty much as anything in the Mexicans abroad. We're going to continue to to obviously see uh, large players. Hopefully, we start hearing more of the of more of our players going over there, anything solidified with other transfers that are going through. So we'll definitely keep you guys updated. Uh, anything else, Tom? Mexican soccer that we finally gotten into. I mean, league. the league started, the national team, the player. It feels like now we're, we're trucking in there, those, those storylines for the Mexican soccer. No, I, mean, I think we covered it. I mean, basically, Tata Batino is the big one, no? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's massive. Um, you know, probably worth mentioning Diego Lainez, the saga with with America and, and Ajax. Ajax, no? What do you say? Yeah, Ajax. Ajax. Ajax? No, it's Ajax. Ajax, uh, you know, th that's that's another massive issue in, in Mexico, in the Mexican game. You know, if Lainez can go to Ajax, it would be absolutely superb. Um, Club America still looking for a striker. I think um, there's reports today that Nico Castillo, Jeez. they might be closing in on Nico Castillo. Castillo wanted to stay in Europe, but it looks like America might be closing in. If America get Nico Castillo, then things are going to get very, very interesting. And the reigning champions open the their campaign, the Clausura campaign on away at Atlas. So I'll be at that one. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, guys, this has been Mexican Soccer Show. Cesar had the night off. Adriana was late at work. I can't believe Cesar, can't believe Cesar, Cesar takes out of it. <laughs> he gets on. Martino, Martino special. He's not, he doesn't even care about the Mexican national <laughs> team anymore. That's the way. Wait on the street is Hernandez doesn't even like Mexico anymore. Oh man, I was that was all that was all Tom says that, says that. <laughs> taking the night off. Adriana working hard at the ESPN studio there in Mexico City couldn't join us today, so it was just Mr. Marshall and Weasel. Um, so we'll uh we'll continue Mexican soccer show every Monday. Uh, we call it Monday Night Football at times. Special thanks to Amy who does an amazing job with producing the show, uh, all the tweets, everything that comes out, and the rundown. Hopefully. Uh, she doesn't uh, get mad at me for not following our script. Uh, sometimes I do that, uh, and I get the producer's call. So, uh, but no, Amy, thank you very much. Uh, again, yeah. all, all of us, and we'll continue to uh, obviously give you a great year in 2019. Lots and lots of Mexican soccer, of course. Follow us. Thanks for subscribing, everybody, on the YouTube channel. And obviously, ask us your questions. Uh, any questions that you guys have, we'll, we'll try to answer them on the show. Uh, so, well, thank you to everybody in the chats. Y nos vemos. El próximo lunes. Adiós.